Good morning and welcome, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Um, a welcome for joint to uh, everyone who's joining our uh, regular but uh, final one for the summer, Patient Safety Collaborative. Um, as Lisa said, my name is Darlene Bolivar, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Collaborative, and I am at the IWK Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And my co-chair is also on the line, which is Tracy Wrong, and she's at CHEO in Ottawa. So welcome, everyone. For those of you who are new to our uh, teleconferencing, the Patient Safety Collaborative meets um, every Friday, every fourth Friday of every month, um, except for the summer months, at this same time. So anyone who is on the line today, uh, feel free to join us um, at any time you want to uh, for future teleconferences on the fourth Friday of each month. So. Without further ado, we'll uh, get into the presentation for today. It's uh, going to be a really exciting presentation called Hospital Watch Live, an innovative platform to control and stop superbugs. And Dr. Michael Gardam, who is the Director of Infection uh, Prevention and Control at the University Health Network in Toronto, was originally invited to present, but he's unable to present today. So in his place, we are delighted to have Niall Wallace and Colin Furness of Infonaut, who are working closely with Dr. Gardam and UHN on the Infection Prevention and Control Project that we're going to have presented to us today. So I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background on both Niall and Colin. Uh, Niall is the co-founder and CEO of Infonaut, Inc., which is a privately held health technology company based in Toronto, and it specializes in hospital disease surveillance, infection prevention, and control. It was born out of Toronto's SARS crisis a few years back uh, when his, Niall and his team uh, decided to take the lessons learned to develop Hospital Watch Live, which is an innovative solution that automates many of the manual practices that infection prevention and control and, and provides a series of tools to help stop an outbreak and presents an evidence-based plan to prevent future outbreaks. So it sounds like something that would absolutely benefit all of us. Uh, Niall is, recognized, uh, is a recognized healthcare and innovation thought leader in Canada and participates in a number of federal and provincial boards and advisory groups. And Colin is the Director of Research and Knowledge Development. He's trained in psychology, information and knowledge management, and human-computer interactions at the University of Toronto, where he is now an adjunct professor of information architecture. Experienced in both quantitative and qualitative social science research for analyzing and developing workplace innovation systems, Colin is, Colin is also currently a master's candidate in epidemiology as part of his duties. He's currently uh, working with Michael Gardam to analyze and publish hand hygiene compliance data and assist uh, movement data. So um, as you can tell, both of our presenters today are well versed in the topic that we're going to be presenting. And I'm going to turn it over to Niall. Thank you very much. Uh, both Colin and I are thrilled to be here today. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, a very interesting perspective and presentation on hospital infection prevention and control. And as a company, we've dedicated ourselves to providing that evidence-based infection control solution to hospitals. Um, we will be focusing on the problem, and that's hospital-acquired infections, and talking a little bit about the magnitude of the problem. I think it's something that everybody's aware of. Um, we'll give you a short history of how we came to be doing what we're doing, because it, it was a very interesting path, and, and SARS was certainly a crisis that we learned a lot of lessons from. Uh, we'll be going through an overview of the Toronto General Hospital Project, where we're working with Dr. Gardam. He can't be here today, but we do have a video clip of him where he's uh, speaking about uh, the project we're engaged with, our approach, and, and how we're working with him. Um, what you will learn today is that uh, we do have an enterprise level surveillance type solution. And privacy has always been front and center uh, in a surveillance uh, type approach. And we are unique in that we have been recognized by the Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, Dr. Ann Kabukian as ambassadors of privacy uh, because of the lengths that we've gone to to ensure that while we are delivering a surveillance program with the steps we've taken around privacy, it uh, can be considered more vigilance than uh, 
than uh, surveillance. And something that uh, a number of us have always struggled uh, uh, is really trying to, we understand the clinical impact of hospital acquired infections, but are we really able to size the economic impact? And if we can do that, then does safety, uh, patient safety and workplace safety uh, become more recognized um, as a driver or within a business plan for doing things in hospitals. So without much further ado, uh, let me just quickly into the problem, which I'm sure that many of us are aware of. Uh, hospital superbugs are a very serious problem, and they're getting worse. And the, the reasons they're getting worse are known for a number of reasons. Uh, in Canada, the Ontario Hospital Association has said that one in nine patients uh, in a hospital will acquire an, some type of infection while in that environment. And the problem is so serious in Canada that uh, up to 12,000 people a year are dying, and that's the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every two weeks. And uh, there is some debate around the size of the cost, but when we look to our audience, uh, members of the United States and our partners there, um, we really see the, the magnitude of the problem just based on, on the size of the populations where CDC has said that it may be as high as the fourth leading cause of death with 90,000 deaths uh, responsible every year. And there's been numbers thrown out as, as high as $45 billion per year in direct costs. So certainly a very serious problem. Now let's just talk about uh, how we got to where we are today in terms of developing a solution to help control and stop infections. Uh, we have a short history for you, but it will start back in 1854. And uh, 1854 was the year of the cholera outbreak in London, uh, where Dr. John Snow mapped out all of the cholera cases uh, in London, uh, discovered that it was not noxious gases that were leading to cholera being spread, but uh, linked to a water pump. And that approach in science really revolutionized the way that we think about the spread of disease and actually led to the, uh, the creation of epidemiology as a science. There's a wonderful book called Ghost Map. It's written by Stephen Johnson, uh, who's, a, who's an amazing TED speaker as well. If anybody wants a compelling uh, read um, around this event and, and how it led to uh, the, its discoveries uh, that it did and, and the nature of scientific inquiry. I'm going to go forward a bit from there to Toronto, Canada in 2003. And we were unlucky enough uh, to bear the brunt of the SARS crisis at that time. It's not well known, but at that period, up to 1% of the greater Toronto area population was in quarantine, and a large number of those people were clinical front lines. I was working within the Ministry of Health at the time and really got to see the magnitude of the problem from the inside uh, and the massive effects that it had, which included uh, canceling non-elective surgeries, closing ERs, uh, uh, thinking about closing down entire hospitals, and we came very close to you know, experiencing a broken healthcare system. And uh, the recommendations that came out of the SARS expert, expert panels uh, really focused on a number of areas, but an important one was the need for uh, surveillance systems in place before a crisis. It was too late to deal with it once, uh, once you were actually immersed in the problem. And so we took those learnings from uh, the SARS expert panel and was working very closely with public health and really started to apply these techniques at a regional level. And we'll use the example of TB, uh, where we were working directly with public health and public health labs. And public health labs really test all the cases that come in through the province, and they do genotype matching. And so at that level, you have an ability to do contact tracing at a, at, at a, within a very large area. So these cases are cataloged across a catchment area, and that information, because of the systems in place in Ontario, can be shared across the province. So the genotype matching can be extended beyond one lab and really into a surrounding region. So we can start investigating why cases uh, look very similar in North Bay and Windsor, in Ottawa, in Toronto, and really aid uh, public health in the investigation on the spread of those particular diseases. Now TB is one example. Uh, this type of approach really works across many of the uh, reportable infectious diseases. And when you have a system like this in place, not only can you start monitoring across the province, but you have the ability to do that uh, across the country and uh, across borders uh, in the United States. And this was a very successful approach for us, and we thought 
that uh, it led to a lot of learnings within public health and gave them a, uh, a rapid response tool. Now we took those learnings from the regional approach and realized that uh, public health and the way that it's structured really has a very strong focus on the local communities. And we wanted to learn more about how we could take those approaches and techniques and apply them into a local community. So we worked with some researchers, public health units, that had connections into various hospitals within area. And if you think, uh, an ER patient will attend a, a local hospital. It may not be the same one every time. But there's information that is derived on the intake. Uh, and that includes the address or postal code of the patient. And when we were able to pull this information almost in real time from a number of different hospitals, you really get a very accurate picture of the uh, surrounding community. And it's that lesson learned that actually allows us to trace back almost in real time that activity back to a hot spot within the community. Now that is useful in itself, but we know that there's trends in disease. And so we were able to compare these against seasonal norms. And really the alerts start to go out when you've got a spike uh, against those seasonal norms. So you're able to determine whether they have normal elevated or high levels for that time of year, influenza and different types of symptom symptoms. And that approach was unique in that we were creating these hot spots or activities of disease by different age cohorts and just putting them on a map. And then with that, we would share that with the public. Now, the public for the first time had a view daily into disease activity within their community that was contexted by the public health message. Public health was able to say, this is what we're seeing in the local community in the immediate area, and this is how we would like you to respond. This is what we're doing as public health. And so it was really used to um, give more information to the public ensure that there was not massive ER surge rates and that the public was properly equipped and had the knowledge to be able to, uh, to respond uh, themselves. And uh, this system is still in place um, in a number of health units in southeastern Ontario. And so you can log in uh, to Infection Watch Live at the Kingston Public Health Unit and still see these maps active today. Now, about two years ago, uh, we were first invited into a hospital and asked if we could take those techniques inside a hospital. Could we start looking at floor plans instead of a map and really sort of draw some of the same conclusions we could in the outside world to the inside world? And what we learned with that project was that, yes, it was possible to do real-time tracking of infection prevention and control. Uh, we could, with the same technology, offer a map and a dashboard to the hospital so they could see what's happening. Um, using many of the same techniques and what we had learned uh, in the outside world and working with uh, leading public health practitioners, we could actually create the tools and offer them uh, so that when uh, cases are discovered in a facility, the tools are in place to help control and stop them. And what was very exciting was the ability to take all of that information and offer an evidence-based evidence plan to prevent the future spread of disease. We had one challenge, though. And that where we were getting the location information from other uh, sources as part of the work with public health, we really had no uh, direct way to track uh, location in a hospital. But we realized, too, that there was already hardware being sold into a hospital. These real-time location systems, which were badges or tags, which were worn by uh, patients and staff and, uh, and, as, and affixed to a assets, that send out regular pings every two seconds. They just say there's a serial number uh, transmitted with a badge and uh, a location. And essentially, these tags are saying, I'm here. And these uh, devices are already sold into hospitals uh, to do things like find and locate uh, equipment and to assist with some of the challenges around operational flow and designing better systems. And so our idea was to use this existing hardware that's already sold into hospitals with the technology developed for public health in the outside world and leverage it for a clinical outcome solution inside the hospital, uh, better infection prevention and control. Now, we actually have a poll at this time. I actually uh, skipped the, the first question, but the, the question we'd like you to answer now is uh, if anybody works in a hospital environment, um, if they know if this type of technology is already at use within the hospital, possibly for uh, asset tracking. And so we'll give you a second just to answer that question.
So if everybody just wants to uh, click either yes or no on the, the poll that's up. So does your hospital have an existing real-time location system to find mobile assets or uh, other use cases? So just uh, if you would select yes or no, we can... Uh, so. Excellent. Thank you. So 89% um, of people online say no, and 11% uh, say yes. They have a, uh, an existing real-time location system. Thank you very much. That corresponds uh, to what we understand in that this is a this technology is being more rapidly adopted, but the current uh, rates of adoption are in about 10% of hospitals. So when you have this technology in the hospital, how would it work to uh, improve infection prevention and control? Now these badges are worn by patients and staff and affixed to assets, and they send out little pings in the facility. And the pings are picked up uh, by existing wireless networks. We take those X's and Y's and we put them onto a very powerful map. And it's the same map we're using in the outside world. We're just happening to be looking at a floor plan instead of, instead of a regular map. And it's a web-enabled technology, so it's accessed through a web browser. And essentially what we're doing is just grabbing the digital breadcrumbs of things moving through a hospital and being able to identify them as patient, staff, or assets. And so we have a very clear understanding of time and space in a hospital and where somebody was and how long they spent. And this is very important because as you have a confluence of events with people, staff, and assets, and then you start having positive cases, we're able to identify hotspots of disease in a hospital based on this history of, of movement. And when you have this information, there's a lot that you can do with it. Uh, at this time, we have one more poll question. Um, we'll ask that now. So do you currently use automated surveillance techniques at your hospital? So again, just please select one of the answers. Uh, the poll results, so, uh, do you currently use automated surveillance techniques at your hospital? Manual only is 25%. The highest is some automation, shared Excel lists, etc. And uh, the lowest being other, and I don't know. So more automation and autom automated hand washing measurement uh, are tied at 13%. So it looks like about half the people or half the organizations represented have some automation. Excellent. Uh, so when you have this location information and you can match it to underlying hospital information systems, and in our case, we are able to match patient records to the ADT. Uh, we have a process to integrate lab results, uh, pharma, and uh, surgery. So we know quite a lot of what's happening to the patient, and we know quite a lot about the assets. Uh, we know very little about the staff, and I'll get to that uh, later in the presentation. So when you have this kind of system in place, you can do a number of things. Uh, you can have a very accurate hand hygiene compliance by embedding the same location technology in the dispensers. Uh, you can calculate movements, contacts, and interaction for contact tracing. Occupational safety is, is a huge component where you can alert staff if they've come into contact with somebody uh, who has an infectious disease. You identify hot spots. You can track the maintenance and cleaning of assets, room cleaning. Um, something that we did a lot in the outside world was start recognizing patterns and it's really what are the emerging trends that we can identify within a hospital based on this new evidence. And positive deviance is the change management process we're working with uh, Dr. Gardam and UHN on, uh, which really brings those, that information back to the front lines and is used to engage staff in a positive and non-threatening way with the evidence that we're gathering around infection control. At this time, I'm going to hand uh, the slides over to uh, Colin Furness, who's going to talk about the, uh, the linkages to pediatric programs, as well as three use case scenarios, which uh, we think are going to illustrate the value of this type of approach. Good morning. Like all areas of medical research, as we say here, uh, only a fraction of, of nosocomial infection research and, and hand hygiene compliance research is aimed at pediatric populations. Uh, my role at Infonaut is, is research, and I see uh, Hospital Watch Live as a research tool just as much as an infection control tool. What we do know uh, from, from the research literature is that uh, hand hygiene compliance in pediatric environments is low. It's similarly low in adult environments, but this has been measured uh, directly in, in pediatric intensive care and, and emergency room departments. 
We know the mortality rates are similarly high as they are in the adult population, about 10%. Um, we know that there's a bit of a different distribution in the kinds of infections uh, that you see in a pediatric environment, uh, that they, they're more likely to be associated with invasive devices, and as far as we can see from the literature, there doesn't seem to be a relationship between length of stay or size of the institution, uh, which does leave a bit of a question as to, as to what is the transmission vector here. Um, hands, hands and hand hygiene may well be it. Uh, we don't know, but we think, we think it could be, and uh, Hospital Watch Live would be the way uh, that that question could perhaps be answered. One thing we're doing at UHN is whenever a new nosocomial infection case is diagnosed, we're able to produce a report that shows what was the hand hygiene compliance around that patient. Mm -hmm. So not by individual staff members, but by patients. So can we, can we see a correlation between uh, an odds ratio or a risk of, of contracting a nosocomial infection uh, at different levels of, of hand hygiene rates uh, around that particular patient. Um, so this is, this is something that, that we think uh, would be particularly helpful in a, in a pediatric environment. We actually have uh, another poll question for everybody. So what are the main challenges with pediatric infection control? And again, just select one answer. So it's not seen as a priority by management, uh, hand washing compliance contact tracing, ensuring there's a clean environment, staff exposure and transmission. So 76% said hand washing compliance uh, is the, one of the main challenges. And uh, distantly behind that is staff exposure and transmission. And uh, at a very low 6% contact tracing and ensuring there is a clean environment. And everybody uh, is indicating that uh, it is seen as a priority by management. So, uh, so I think everybody knows what to do. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's three scenarios I wanted to describe briefly. Uh, the first under the rubric of workplace safety. I always describe hospitals as extremely dangerous places to work. I'm sure that's not a, a surprise to anyone, uh, anyone listening today. Uh, we know from a Canadian study that was done two years ago that hospital staff workplace absenteeism for gastrointestinal and respiratory illness is a lot higher than the general population. And this is through statistics compiled by our Workplace Safety Insurance Board, which means we're not talking about sniffles, we're talking about significant absences, so, so significant illnesses. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very high difference. We know that families of hospital staff are a lot more likely to be colonized with MRSA. And again, it's, this is awful, and it's also not surprising. We have observed in the past, in, in, a, in a previous pilot, uh, rooms being cleaned, hospital rooms being cleaned, uh, with only a few minutes per room, which makes real cleaning not possible. And this is, this is during an outbreak. We also observed at one pilot site uh, a large number of mobile assets leaving isolated rooms during an outbreak and going all over the hospital. And this is something that when we fed that information back to infection control, they had no idea. So turning to Hospital Watch Live and, and what it can do about this situation, um, what we're showing you now is uh, what's called a location exposure report. So if there is a person or equipment in particular that uh, has, has been contaminated and been around uh, the hospital, we can actually map that. What rooms have been exposed? And you can see different shades that, that has to do with the degree of exposure, the number of assets, the amount of time that it's been there. Uh, it's prohibitively expensive to close a ward for, for a terminal clean, but this uh, potentially allows uh, very, very targeted cleaning. Targeted cleaning by obviously very scarce uh, very scarce uh, cleaning resources. The other piece, though, uh, to go straight to occupational safety is staff exposure. Um, we talked to staff at UHN to say, well, how would you know if you've been exposed to tuberculosis? Because they get them in a case a month. And this is something they don't like to talk about so much, but the answer is no one really knows. You try and do contact tracing from the charts, from the staffing schedules, you don't really know. And uh, someone who's wearing a Hospital Watch Live badge uh, we would actually be able to calculate not only whether or not they were exposed, and not only when, but the exact duration. So we would really be able to measure that quite carefully, and, and that duration is obviously very important for TB. Uh, and it's also important to mention that staff are actually alerted by badge number only. 
uh, the, the system is not surveillance. We will come back to that and talk about that, but we are not following individuals around. We are uh, pulling reports that show badge numbers of people who have been exposed, and that gets passed on to, to occupational health and safety. So we are, we are trying, uh, we've tried very hard to balance, essentially, privacy with this kind of vigilance and, and staff protection. So that's, that's the first scenario, and that's workplace safety. The second one is the broad area of infection control. And there's two things to talk about. One is contact tracing, which I already touched on, and the other is, is disease hotspot analysis. So contact tracing helps hospitals, in theory, better detect, manage, and control infections. It's extremely time-consuming. It's extremely crude. It's incomplete by definition, and therefore, it is really rarely done. And the information is often not all that useful. Uh, you may have heard of six degrees of separation, or six degrees of Kevin Bacon, as we like to call it. Um, and and this, is, this is a visualization of, you know, looking way over to the right, you have a case turn up and trying to figure out exactly where that came from. And if, and if we can figure out where that came from very quickly and with a certain amount of accuracy, uh, we can intervene. We can isolate, we can test, and if it's equipment, we can, we can do very targeted disinfection. So this is, this is contact tracing on steroids. Rather than being incomplete and time consuming, it's very complete and instantaneous. Uh, we also have the capability to assess uh, patient risk, so we can look at their we can the system can look at their at their health record and look for the obvious kinds of things that put them at higher risk. Are they on dialysis? Uh, are they immune compromised from organ transplant or or, uh, or HIV infection? Are they on antibiotics? Have they had recent surgery? Are they a readmit? These are the these are the kinds of risk factors that that are, are obviously widely known. Uh, we can we can actually do a calculation on that so that when you do a contact trace and you end up with a giant amount of data, you can sort the highest risk people to the top of the list first. So rather than just being overwhelmed by data, which is one thing that we learned uh, is a bad thing to do for infection control folks, rather than being overwhelmed, they're actually able to, to order and prioritize their response. I think that's, that's very important, fitting the, the amount of data and the way it's presented to uh, certain workplace realities. So, uh, the third scenario I want to talk about is, is infection prevention, uh, the gold standard. If we, can, if we can prevent it, we don't need to control it. And preventing infection, as I touched on before, uh, with, with hand hygiene rates in, in pediatrics, uh, pediatric contexts, we think hand hygiene uh, compliance is the best way, and driving that number up is the best way to, to, limit, uh, to limit infections. However, measurement is obviously very poorly done. There was a recent study done at uh, Cedar Springs Hospital in, in California where they looked at self-report uh, by doctors on hand hygiene, and then they did an objective measurement, and there, there was a difference literally by an order of magnitude. Uh, the gold standard uh, in many places is simply a manual audit, a known, a known person with a clipboard standing there. You get what are known as Hawthorne effects, that is people who change their behavior because they know they're being observed. This is, this is human nature. Uh, you may get 60 observations a month on a ward, a hospital watch live, which is persistent, not just the 20 minutes on a, on a Thursday afternoon, but seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, could generate tens of thousands. Uh, we see hand hygiene compliance as a, as a knowledge activity, as a, an activity that's actually deeply embedded in work practices. It is very tricky to change, but the first part of change is being able to measure it accurately and feed that back to the staff members. So our hand hygiene compliance <laughs> tracks uh, the World Health Organization moments one and four, the before patient contact, after patient contact. The, the middle ones uh, obviously cannot really, cannot really be measured. No one can know what, what happens behind that screen. Um, and uh, so the dispensers recognize that a clinician is there. So a clinician approaches gel dispenser. Uh, the system knows that they've cleaned their hands. The clinician approaches the patient uh, in close proximity. The clinician goes back and clean their hands. And the, the system has counted two opportunities, and, and in this case, in this demonstration, 100% uh, compliance. We know that there is not a perfect correlation between before and after hand hygiene practices, uh, which is some, something we, we did in our, in our own research. And it, again, it underscores this is a complex phenomenon. It's not enough just to tell people to do it. It's not enough to have someone with a clipboard. You actually really need to measure this carefully uh, in order to be able to feed that information back, in order to be able to change behavior. And so we're looking now at a hand hygiene compliance report. We do not use this as a policing tool. We do not provide individual feedback, 
And there's a number of reasons for that, but the main reason is that when you when you devalue people's judgment and their knowledge work to the to the point of of holding a stick over their head, uh, they cease to trust the system. They start to resent it. We don't think staff would accept it. We don't think staff would use it. Uh, we want people to trust it. We want people to feel they're being protected by it, and we want people to feel that it's in everyone's best interest. And and singling people out for punishment uh, is is actually not the way to do it. We we see it as being a, a social behavior or, as, or a question of behavioral norms, and therefore. We are reporting on hand hygiene compliance by job type because we do know that there's a huge difference between them. And I think the numbers in this sample report are being quite generous to physicians. <laughs> and and we, we can do it by shift and we can do it by, by geography or by area of the hospital. So uh, this is Niall again. Uh, thank you very much, Colin. Uh, just illustrating three of the many use scenarios, usage scenarios that we have uh, once this type of evidence has been gathered. Um, just to talk a little bit about the scope of use at Toronto General Hospital and working with Dr. Gardam. Um, we're working within the multi-organ transplant and MSICU. Um, this is two floors and the full study is running for a period of 18 months. Uh, we're looking for sustained goals, and it's really when this evidence is brought into a change management program such as positive deviance, which is used highly effectively within Toronto General Hospital, can you see an increased sustained uh, drop in infection rates and an increased sustained adherence to best practices uh, by providing the evidence back to the front lines in the manner that we do. And uh, the system went live in February in terms of the, the technical go live. And we've recently started working directly with uh, the clinicians and other people within the facility gathering this information. And it's starting to be fed back uh, into the programs now. As an operational impact, uh, we spent two years in a simulated hospital environment ensuring that, one, we take about 15 minutes to install the system per room. Uh, we are ensuring that we're leveraging existing programs around change management and education um, so the impact of people on the floor is as low as possible. Uh, it's also important to note that we're really not asking for any changes in behavior or usage uh, or uh, that the nurses would or doctors would normally do within the facility. There's really no changes to what they would do apart from adherence to the practices um, that they're following. It's interesting to note too that in three hospitals uh, east of Toronto where we started working with the same solution, um, just by going around and uh, affixing a badge to all of the mobile assets within the facilities, we found 200 mobile assets that the hospital didn't know that they had owned. And so even before switching the system on, um, and the ROI is also very important uh, you know, to, to be able to describe to management that the investments here are worthwhile. Um, across all three hospitals, uh, it's about three and a half million dollars worth of assets that were located uh, by medical assets, and the hospital are now um, able to manage those assets properly. So a discovered, uh, found money um, just by going through a, a tagging uh, process. And we have a word from uh, uh, about a minute from Dr. Gardam just explaining his interest in the project and what he expects. So we'll run that now. I'm Dr. Michael Gardam. I'm an infectious disease specialist here in Toronto, and I'm also the director of infection prevention and control here at the University Health Network. So what's the challenge of infection control in hospitals? Really, the, the, the big challenge in a nutshell is that we have a pretty good idea of what we need to do to try to prevent the spread of infections. The problem is, is we're not very good at actually doing those things. So for example, hand washing is something we've known for the last 150 years is very important. But there's lots of literature out there showing that although hand washing looks like a simple thing for people to do, it's actually very, very hard to get healthcare workers to clean their hands. A similar problem we have with uh, uh, cleaning the environment. A similar problem we have with uh, screening patients to see if they're carrying superbugs, et cetera. So there's, there's lots of information out there. The problem isn't so much we don't know what to do. The problem is, is we don't know actually how to do the things that we need to do. Why am I interested in the Infonaut solution? I'm interested in Infonaut because it allows us to measure a bunch of things that we were never really able to measure before, or at least weren't able to measure very well. 
So, for example, you know, currently we know that patients are able to pick things up from, you know, surfaces and things like that. But we're not able to really measure that. Uh, and with the Infonos system, for example, we're able to look and see which uh, pieces of equipment patients were in contact with, which, which types of staff people were in contact with. And we can also tell, for example, how well staff are actually cleaning their hands with that particular patient. So it allows us to basically lift up a very big rock and see all of this all of this stuff going on and get all this information from it that we've never been able to measure before. So I'm very I'm really uh, uh, excited about being able to get that information, learn what's going on, and then feed that back to the frontline staff to help them to start being able to make things better. So what are the uses, benefits, and outcomes I hope to see with this uh, project? What I hope to see with this, uh, first of all, is that we really shine a light on all of the stuff that's currently going on in the hospital. So how well are we actually cleaning our hands? How often are we moving pieces of equipment room to room to room? How often are we shifting mattresses between rooms? You know, start to really be able to shine a light on all of these things that are going on that we know can all spread infections. Once we've reached that step, what I'm really, uh, what I'm really hoping to see is that frontline staff will realize the system we're working in is really well designed to spread infections and they will start making changes, whether it be cleaning their hands more, cleaning equipment more, not moving equipment around so much, they'll start making all of these changes that I, I am hoping we're going to start seeing decreasing infection rates. Uh, so some, uh, some very interesting words from Dr. Gardam. Um, we had mentioned earlier in the presentation about the focus on privacy and the fact that we've been recognized by the Privacy Commissioner for uh, a surveillance solution, which I, I think that her recognition is unique in itself. Um, we'd like to talk about vigilance, not surveillance, and we can do that uh, because of how we're engaging with staff. And the privacy for staff is, is utmost. Uh, you know, to start with, there's really no impact to the workflow uh, of the staff. We're just asking them to uh, wear a badge, uh, the RT, uh, RTLS badge, which sends out these pings, uh, and it really has no other impact uh, on them. Uh, we've made the in, uh, participation in the program com completely voluntary, and as part of the training that we do, we actually show them how to defeat the system. Uh, if they don't feel comfortable uh, participating, and they have uh, registered as a volunteer, um, it's as simple as taking the badge off. Um, we've made the tracking completely anonymous. We receive a serial number from the badge and a location, uh, but we don't have any information that connects the serial number uh, back to an individual staff member's name. Uh, in the case of uh, staff exposure, uh, we would share the badge number uh, with Occupational Health and Safety and the staff and allow them to self-identify. Um, all of the uh, results, like hand hygiene compliance, are aggregated at a group level. Um, so you're able to run reports by doctors, by nurses, by allied health for a period of time uh, in a particular unit with the end number always being five or greater. And uh, the give back and the to the staff and encouragement to participate is, is around, uh, the, the primary way would be around uh, that staff exposure alerts, being able to inform them if they came in contact uh, with somebody or something that was positive for TB. And the decision making with PD as a change management process, the results go back to the group and it's really the group that this decides what to do. And I think this Big friend approach is uh, is very different from the uh, from the big brother approach um, that is more common within surveillance solutions. Finally, uh, we want to talk a little bit uh, about the economics of uh, infections, and the focus is certainly on uh, clinical and, and occupancy outcomes. Um, but and the challenge with the investments in patient safety in general is that the, the costs around uh, this are not well understood. And uh, we have a model, and we think it's very conservative. Uh, we've worked with some of the thought leaders in the space around infection uh, costs. And if we just take an average 250-bed hospital in Ontario uh, with the average rates, uh, infection rates posted by the Ministry of Health, um, a, a single hospital, single average hospital, 
would experience direct treatment costs in the area of 980,000. And I think this would be the most common number that if people were talking about the economic impacts of infectious uh, diseases in hospitals would be this first line. Um, if you look at other costs and indirect costs associated with infections, if you are isolating patients, if you are closing down ICUs, if you are closing areas of the hospitals or limiting uh, other patient exposure, you've really got a lot of opportunity costs involved in people in the, the community that are not able to receive treatment at your facility uh, because you are dealing with, with the problem. Um, outbreak response costs are fairly typical, uh, at least $10,000 a month. Um, if you are a hospital that ex experienced a, a major C. difficile outbreak, for example, as we've seen in Ontario at Niagara, uh, in Hamilton, uh, your response costs are in the millions of dollars, uh, primarily around environmental cleaning and increased awareness. Um, there is uh, certainly a legal and liability impact. Um, the Canadian and U.S. systems are very different. Uh, and the impact of staffing, uh, we think that this is a low number, but based on the absenteeism rates, uh, short-term disability claims, um, as studied by the uh, Public Sector Health and Safety Association, are anywhere from $25,000 to $120,000 per claim. I mean, this all gets us to a fairly large annual cost when broken down on a cost per bed per day, um, on average can be around $36. And so just a very interesting way of trying to uh, frame the problem um, uh, in, in order to get more investments in patient safety and infection control. So with that, we've talked for a little while now. Uh, we've reserved some time for Q&A. I will say that the uh, Gary Larson cartoon that we've borrowed uh, and the alerting around individuals who haven't washed their hands is really not what we're about. So let me just put a line through that. Uh, we believe that uh, group behavior can be uh, encouraged and it's not helped by um, the, you know, the carrot is better than the stick. Uh, so with that, we'll hand that over back to the organizers and see if there's any questions today. Sure. Just a reminder, uh, if anybody would like to, uh, if they have any questions or comments, um, please write their question into their uh, control panel on the right-hand side of their screen. And uh, if not, uh, if you believe that you have a microphone that's working on your computer, uh, if you could raise your hand as well, I can try to unmute your line. And uh, uh, I don't actually have any questions. I think somebody might be typing right now. So, uh, Darlene, did you have any comments? I do, I do actually. Thank you so much for that presentation, uh, both uh, Niall and Colin. It was great. Um, I, I guess I really like the philosophy of vigilance, not surveillance, because we do talk a lot about surveillance in healthcare. So, I mean, that's where the positive deviance, et cetera, comes in. One of the comments or um, thoughts that I'd like you to comment on is as we move more and more to portable devices such as computers on wheels or quote robots that go room to room, um, do you track that as well and um, what are your thoughts on utilizing that kind of technology versus more stationary in room uh, technology? That's, that's a really good question. Um, my own sense, this is Colin, my own sense is that the jury is still out on that. We just don't know enough yet about what are the, what are the biggest transmission vectors. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tempting to say that in-room things that don't move around will, will spread things around a little bit less. Uh, but you may end up with rooms that have pathogen reservoirs in them that, that end up uh, being more persistent. This, this, is, this is hard to say. We're hoping that we can shed some light on that. Uh, we are currently tagging a number of different mobile assets at UHN, and we're really, really looking forward to being able to uh, do, do some data analysis there and, and get a sense of what's the correlation between these devices and, and, and subsequent infections. So I, I think it's a, it's, it's, a it's a great question and, and we're really hoping to be able to answer that over the next year. Hi, this is Niall. Uh, you know, I, I certainly think that we expect uh, to gather quite a lot of evidence around uh, the role that mobile assets play uh, as vector transmissions and a lot of it depends as well as to the, the contact that some of these, this equipment has with the patient. Uh, for example, at UHN, we are tracking med cards, pumps, wheelchairs. 
beds, mattresses, um, and in some cases commodes. And we feel that we're going to be able to determine uh, through evidence the risk factors associated with, with each of those and the roles that they, that they can play. It was interesting having some conversations with uh, environmental cleaning staff and nurses uh, around the, the, the theory that the commodes are, are going to play the most uh, direct line in, in the, that transmission spread. And their feeling was that staff realized this already and that commodes may be the ones that are cleaned most diligently. So we're starting to get into some of the social aspects of environmental cleaning and the role uh, that all of these different players have um, to ensure that the hospital uh, is as clean and safe as possible. Yeah, great, thanks. So I had the opportunity to be on a, a national uh, teleconference call where we were talking about uh, keyboards and mobile keyboards and um, they're making now, which you probably already know, autoclavable keyboards that supposedly you can autoclave up to five times before it actually um, impacts the functionality of the keyboard. Uh, that's so very that's interesting. interesting. Lisa, are there any other questions on the line? I have a couple of questions. So um, do you get buy-in from the staff to wear these badges? I find it would be difficult for staff to volunteer when they know they are being monitored. Um, yeah, and I, I think I think that's an excellent question and uh, certainly um, that we think that it is uh, one of the issues that we have tried to address up front. And when it comes down to it, it really is all about trust. And so our intention is not to be able to identify uh, individuals by name and then associate um, any of the, the, the individual's actions back to them. Um, and, and we certainly realize that this is uh, what we have to do to gain that trust. And so again, I would refer back to what we discussed around our approach to privacy is that we have made this completely voluntary and the hospital has made this completely voluntary to staff. Um, if they don't want to participate, they don't. And if they do and they lose trust in what we're doing, uh, we instruct them on how to defeat the system, which is as simple as removing the tag. and leaving it in your locker, hooking it up to a friend's coat, or uh, you know, dropping a glass of water. There's lots of ways to subvert the process. So that approach, uh, as well, just group reporting, no individual reporting, uh, and the give back around uh, um, infection alerts, uh, we feel is an appropriate response. And um, so far, so good. I mean, we have staff that are enthusiastically participating and um, it's interesting to see the, uh, the cooperation amongst physicians, nurses, and allied health, and, and environmental cleaning staff in the program. And so it, we feel that in a lot of ways it really drives a team approach um, without trying to, uh, to, to uh, point the finger at anybody. That's great. Thank you. Um, there is a, a question about um, cost. Um, around cost. So I think what I'll do is maybe um, um, I'll, I'll direct that question to you offline, uh, Niall, and you can, uh, okay. you can have those. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Are there other questions on Elaine? Lisa? Elaine, did you have some comments? Oh, I just have a couple of comments. I, first of all, um, to Niall and and um, to, to and and to Colin, thank you so much. I this has been so enlightening. Um, I think that this is something that um, impacts every single uh, healthcare organization in the country. It, it impacts many organizations, but we'll just talk about healthcare this morning. And it is extremely innovative. One of the things, just in this last round, this last particular question that comes to mind is, you know, participation. I think would promote compliance, um, and and I, I I certainly see it that way as well. And it's a little bit of well, if I'm participating and I'm being monitored, I'm going to comply. And and I I think there's a there there's a very uh, there could be a very successful strategy. In, in you know in that in itself 
And I'm just wondering if, if you can sort of comment on, on that. It's not a matter of, no, I don't want to participate, but through participation, your compliance increases and therefore your rate of infection decreases. Can you comment on that now? Sure, this is Colin. I'll, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we frame hand hygiene compliance as a social norms question, mm -hmm. uh, a cultural question. And so it really gets down to what is normal. Once 50% plus one people are wearing these badges, it becomes quite normal. And I think we, we, do, we do expect uh, to observe exactly what you suggested, which is the act of wearing this, um, it, it represents a tangible commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, the social psychology literature says if you can get someone to take a small step in one direction, uh, you can actually then have their attitude pivot to match that. So we do expect that. On the other side of the fence, though, there are Hawthorne effects, which suggest that in many cases such, uh, such change can be quite temporary, uh, that health behavior change, all behavior change is very difficult to sustain. And we know there's a school of thought in infection control that says, I can get my hand hygiene compliance up to 80% for two weeks, but I can't increase it by 1% permanently. And so that's, that's, obviously, that's obviously a piece of it, too, and we think that um, it, by, by framing it as social norms, by framing it as, well, what do people do around here? Oh, I see. People wear these badges, and they're protected, and they'll know if they've been exposed to TB, and yeah, they'll probably clean their hands more, and patients are asking about it. I've had so many conversations with patients and other, other staff, non-clinical staff, about this, uh, that the, the, we're, hoping, we're hoping the awareness drives social norms and that changes becomes permanent on that basis, not because of the device, but because it's the normal thing to do. And Colin, that was, uh, thank you, and, and uh, just a tiny comment to that, that was my next part of the, the question is then what happened, it's sustainability. We all know that that is the biggest challenge, so again, by participating, there's the, you address that component as well. Yeah, and I, you've, you've hit the nail on the head, mm -hmm. you know, sustained behavior change uh, then becomes culture. Uh, exactly. If it's sticky enough, it becomes culture, and uh, we would love to be a part of a culture change within an organization where really the, the staff are seeing benefits, the patient, patients are certainly seeing benefits, and, and management is really there to encourage those types of culture change, and, um, and we think that we've got an approach that, uh, that will work on a number of levels. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I, uh, there's no more questions that are uh, typed in here, uh, Darlene, so uh, just looking at the time here, I don't know if you want to go ahead and, uh, and wrap up. I will. Thank you, Lisa. Again, I want to thank both uh, Niall and Colin for bringing us this information. And um, without being too presumptuous, I would like to take the opportunity to say, we, um, at the 18-month mark, when uh, you've got the project kind of um, farther down the road, we'd be delighted if you'd be willing to come back and share some of the results from the project with us as well. Without putting you on the spot right now, I'll just uh, leave that as an open invitation uh, for some future work with us. Uh, absolutely, and um, we uh, we hope that Dr. Gardam would be uh, front and center of that as well uh, as he's conducting a lot of the academic research. Great, that would be wonderful. And as Lisa said, uh, it will. This presentation will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network at CAFC. So, thank you very much, both of you, for uh, for your willingness and for bringing us this great information. For those on the call, I'd like to just uh, thank everybody for their participation online with the polls and for being part of the webinar today. And just remind people that there will be no calls in July and August. So our next uh, actual scheduled webinar will be September the 28th and uh, there will not also be a webinar in October. Uh, in October is the CAFC um, annual meeting and conference and as part of that we will be doing a patient safety symposium on October the 28th in Vancouver and we're hoping that that will be well attended and uh, I know it will be very enlightening. The theme this year or the title this year is called I Play for Patient Safety, Innovation and Integration, Integration Using Simulation. So Dr. T Deborah Ter, um, Ter I always trip over her name, Ter Bruno um, from York University and Dr. Uh, Vince Grant will be on hand to present that. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in Vancouver. 
Thank you all and have a wonderful summer.